Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizer for uh, making this wonderful meeting happening. Many old friends here, some new friends. Very happy to be here. Um, so this is joint work with Paolo Pigato, Paul Garcia, and Tom. And it wasn't that Gray and my uh, some uh, ongoing, uh, you know, development. How to connect bits and pieces of classical Sudassian house and slash traditions, the past principle to you know uh, some of these um, fun questions that we like. To have. And as a matter of fact, I will spend the first half an hour on uh, on this problem motivated from uh, quantitative finance. But I hope I will convince you that the rough bars idea is very useful and for the structures, and you can take the same ideas somehow and transport them to a single SPD because that's the theme of the meeting. So, so you have very different applications, but ground is a similar thinking helps. Uh, and of course, I'm very happy about this development that these things come together. Because for the better part of my life, I had to keep these very separate. It was a very bad idea, to, you know. To uh, write papers on fractional black shoals, it was a very bad idea. And it's still a bad idea, but if you did it in the right way, then it's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> uh, all right. So that's the outline. We do a little bit of, of uh, short dated option pricing, large deviations. I will tell you quickly why implied volatility is actually a meaningful mathematical object. We talk about rough wall as one formula. So if you do Applied probability say, you know, yet today existence weakness is not good enough, you want some useful formula to use, and here it is. Uh, let's use some numerical evidence and it works. And then we, we go back to uh, the theory and think of rough wall as an example of the Google Ego structure. I'll keep it short, but you can, it's a, it's a fun example to have. And then we talk finally about this, uh, this one example, this GPAM. Uh, it's a single SPDE, and I hope by that time you'll be convinced that this, this procedure works. And uh, I will put the pieces together here in the, in the end a little bit. Okay, I should say that this final part here, this Laplace asymptotics for GPAM, that's, that's work, trying work with my PhD student Tom Close, and he will be here next week, and I think he will give a very detailed talk about all this, so, so I'm not going to, to do all this. Okay, so we do a little bit of fire. So um, if you phrase your sigma, then this is just the Black Scholes model. So you can take the logarithm at what you look at this is basically is prime motion. And so let's drop rates, dividends, all this stuff. So again, the log price here is basically prime motion with a drift. And then just uh, notation wise, you have this parameter k, if you do call options. And here, you know, you introduce the log k, the little k, the log strike. And so you can write down European call option prices down this form here. So instead of S, you prefer to write E to the you know, exponential of X. So you put all everything you can on Brownian scale somehow. And that the price instead of capital K, you have expansion of little k, etc. So those, these are calls and puts. So, okay, so far, I guess, familiar. And of course, in, in Black Scholes, the marginals are just, you know, one dimensional Gauss fans, and here they are with some mu, with some drift here, which signals this, this uh, Black Scholes volatility. And now let's do a little bit of an exercise. So you can look at um, you know, a variety of options. This is the call options that we had on the previous slide. And of course, in that setting, you can just spell out the integral, and here it is, not, not very interesting. You can also look at something a bit simpler, which is just saying we're looking at the probability that your, your stock price ends up somewhere beyond a certain level, right? It's known as a digital uh, call option, and that's just a probability, so here it is. And then there's, it, has, it has a name, uh, there's a name for it, but it's just a density, right? <laughs> Fundamental security, you don't forget. In the discrete setting, you get one if you're there, and zero else, and so the continuous setting, you know, put it here. All right. So, uh, well, we can do a little bit of calculus. I mean, no one likes these explicit integrals here, especially not in infinite dimensions. 
but if you are happy with this sort of asymptotic equivalence, then the density, of course, has nothing to do here. The precise, I mean, you can, you can drop some garbage here, but, but this is basically an exact expression. If you do a standard, you know, asymptotics for, for Gaussian integrals, you get, of course, this here. And if you do a little extra work for, the, for this call option, you know, you have this hockey stick payoff, then it starts looking, starts to look like this. So what do I want you to observe here? That this leading order factor, so in the language of finance, we're talking about out of the money option, so k is positive. So if, you know, if t runs to zero, you, I mean, this, this log price xd has been normalized at the time, you know, the time zero, when you expire, somehow you end up at zero. So then you are sort of out of money, you get nothing. So all these guys go to zero. The question is at which rate. And so you have this large deviation factor here that tells you how quickly. And this large deviation factor here is also the same. And what you can spy here, the exponent, some of the, the rate function, we'll come to that a little bit later. But more interestingly for us here is somehow what happens when you eat into this expansion here. What's the next guy? And so, of course, the density we know that's a 1 over square root t. If you do this one here, there's nothing that expels this all between 0 and 1, so as a matter of fact, you have a square root t. And if you integrate somehow morally one more time, you have a t to the 3 half, and there's some complicated stuff here that, you know, you will believe me, you can do it, you don't want to do it yourself. So you have these algebraic factors lurking around and increasingly complex constants. So, okay, like Scholz is, of course, not the the end of financial wisdom. So people have moved to uh, stochastic volatility models, and uh, I think it's a, it's a coffee break conversation if that's a good idea or a bad idea, but it's you know it's, it's very common. And so instead of looking at uh, basically brown motion, you look at the generic diffusion process, typically Markov, because then you can use PDEs and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And so let's just assume that your the log price that you're interested in is somehow one component of a 2, 3, or 17 dimensional mark of diffusion that you can write in the standard form. <coughs> Happens all the time. And so now, if you do a short dated pricing, so again, here we're looking at the, the development here for small time. So if you try to do the same, then it's a classical idea to turn the short time into small noise problem. That just means you, you know, instead of working with small time, say, T, you work with a unit time interval and use Brownian scaling to make this epsilon appear. So instead of looking at that guy at short times, you look at this guy here, rescale at unit time, and what you have is this epsilon that comes out. So your epsilon is the square root t if you want. Yeah? And here in the drift term, the scaling makes it epsilon square appear. So on the large division scale, I mean, this guy is not visible at all. But if you go in further, of course, you will see something. Right, so what can you say? Well, I mean, now you're in the realm of, of small noise and doctors for diffusions, so <coughs> Friday Menzel type stuff. And so in particular, you have, I mean, when I write this double twiddle, I always mean this, this you know, crude logarithmic uh, equivalence that you know from large deviations. So then large deviation tells you that this probability that, that your, you know, rescale price is beyond some level k here is small, and that's this rate function here. And I haven't written it in the slide here, but this, this, uh, this energy K here has in this Markovian setting a nice geometric interpretation that's, you know, some of the, the one half the distance square of the starting point to this hyper yeah, manifold given by this, this determined by the strike here. So we have a nice geometric interpretation here. Uh, right, so again here spelled out as epsilon. If you don't like epsilon, you can transfer it back to your small time parameters. So here's your T again. It's the same thing, okay? So name, terminology, the straight <coughs> function, energy, whatever. And in Black Scholes, this of course is just this it's the Euclidean rate function if you want, it's k square half, and then you have still the sigma square half. And so here's a, a first fun fact. If you match these two guys, this here, right? I mean, well, it doesn't matter, epsilon is small, t is small. If you match this guy here, with this one here, how can you do that? Well, you can't, but there's a dirty trick in finance that people will say, well, let's look at the Black Scholes model and pick the one sigma that matches the actual observed price. So that will depend on your t and your k. It's called implied volatility. That's what traders look at every day. So we can do the same here. We sort of put in this, this 
this effective implied volatility, so, so this rate function here now becomes this one, depends on K and T, and now we can sort of you know, match it, so, so the hand waving, but there, there are also theorems that make this precise. You can now match it, so at least for T small, it should behave like this K here. And so now what you see is that you have a direct correspondence between this rate function or energy or distance squared <coughs> To the implied volatility. So there's a lot of geometric meaning, at least in Markovi models, for the implied volatility. And in a sense, it's a, it's, it might be even a better object than this one, because this guy here, somehow by construction, when k is zero, it's zero, that's, you know, you pay nothing if you don't want to move. And for a little bit, this is like k square. So what you see here is this k square somehow is constant out here. So in a sense, this guy here gets rid of this built in redundancy. So it's, a, it's on. If you think mathematically, implied wall, short data, it's like a It's the same scale. It has a name, by the way, PBF, Perestique, Christophe, Florent. It's a paper in CPAM 2004. Right, summary, well, to be in order, you can combine these things here. So let's look at the, the Lachivicius <coughs> stuff. This is what I said earlier. You have this, this energy interpretation. It's the cheapest way to get from wherever you start to this level k here. Right? So I don't need to, to introduce all the notations. So this is the n-dimensional diet, it's the first component, and that's the, 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 the constraint you have. You want to end up at time one at level. So this is a multi-dimensional diet. If I remove the pole, that's my first component, and that component I want at time one to be at this level k. Okay? I think it's k. Right, and that's what we had just uh, said here. Right. And so now there's a very natural question, and that's not an academic question. Uh, you know, this is a useful formula. So what is the next order term? Right? This is an asymptotic relation as t goes to zero. So this means goes to zero when t goes to zero. And so what's the next guy? And then that matters when you do numerics, of course. The second question is, what happens when you <coughs> go beyond the Markovian setting? There's been a lot of interest in that. And so the toy example to have in mind is to say, okay, like in stock wall, you randomize your, your volatility, so in Black Scholes it's a constant, but then in, in the stochastic wall models you randomize it, it's, you know, there's another diffusion running it, but in rough wall you say, okay, it's, still, it's also randomized, but it's randomized not on a diffusive scale, but on a fractional scale. So there are many ways you can make this happen. The cheapest one is you take a fractional power motion, for instance, cooked up in this form here, so that's called a Levy fractional power motion, and then you stuff it in some function sigma, which is as nice as you want. So if typically people want to take here an exponential function because then you get, in addition, the log normality of the volatility process, it's something you can like. Uh, okay, so it's a new class of models, very popular these days. And then the last question is, is it numerically useful? I'll give you a picture. Um, right, I think I go quickly on this one. There, so there are known answers to these questions in special models with special structure. And in these, without going into details, you would know, for instance, that call prices would behave asymptotically like, like a black show. So you have this one over T. So this is somewhat generic. This is the large deviation part. And then you have this T three half. So you remember, we have this in black shows. That's actually generic, at least for small k near the money. For small k, this is generic. There's a quite non trivial paper by Kusoka Struk using this Kusoka, sorry, Kusoka Osajima, using this Kusoka Struk theory of uh, asymptotics on, on Wiener space. So There's a heavy paper that gave you this. Uh, there are other models where you can do it somewhat by hand. But, so this, this guy here is somewhat generic. Right. At least in the diffusives model. We'll see how it changes when you're non-diffusive. Non and I, this, once you have this guy here, you can translate or you can infer this refined implied volatility expansion. So this guy here that you're looking for can be extracted from this one, provided you know what's going on here. Okay, so mathematically the problem of going further here is one of going further here. And that means going beyond large deviations and well, therefore, doing something that's very different from the past, as obvious. Right, here's some, some uh, I don't want to spend much time on it, just this rough volatility that I mentioned. This is nothing 
that was dreamed up by bored, you know, rough mass people. Um, but this came from a, from a time series paper. We looked at data, so, so this is a big development that if you know finance, there's this P measure, this is Q measure, and the roughness is somehow in both worlds you want it. The time series data tells you it's in the P measure, and if you look at option price data and the price volatility skews, it's actually you also want it in the Q measure. And so to top it up, there's a micro, a market microstructure model using Hox processes that gives a scaling limit and outcomes rough volatility. So as far as a good story goes in applied mathematics, this is a good story. Right. So let's look at, at uh, you know, let's leave behind fragile events. Let's look at large situations in a fractional setting. So again, the time model is this one here. You take, you always want to build in a little bit of correlation. So what you see here is just a standard brown motion that you build on two independent brown motions, and then you you know you put them together in some some way. But this is a standard brown motion. The reason I wrote it in this way is that I want a correlation of this guy here with the one I have in here. So this WH was built using this W here using this Volterra formula. Okay, so this is. I could drop it if I wanted, then I have an uncorrelated model, but then for, for various reasons that's not interesting in finance. So this is the, the simplest model you want to look at. And again, H, the, the evidence from P and Q is that H is smaller than a half, and in fact, much smaller than a half. So 0 0.1 is roughly the regime you're looking at. And then you can try your usual scaling trick because you know fraction bound motion is nice scaling. And the first thing you notice is that your your Trick A out of fragile events doesn't work because the scaling is wrong. Here you get out an epsilon, right? Epsilon square two. Here you get the down and scaling gives you epsilon, and here you get epsilon two H. So the two don't run on the same scale. So you have to do something which is fortunately quite simple, but you have to do it, which is a little bit scaling. You just have to force this epsilon here to run at the same speed as this epsilon two H. So what you have to do is multiply the whole thing. This absolute 2h divide by epsilon, but now we have everything in the same scale. So the rescaled x epsilon, you can expect to have a large deviation with a modified speed function. So here it is. This is the guy we, we had, then we, we do this little play around, so we rescale it to this epsilon. We have to do it, because only then can we arrange for everything to run on the, space, the same speed epsilon bar, because so epsilon bar is a shorthand for epsilon 2h. And now what you see is that with some good will that in this room I will find, such a stochastic integral is a function of epsilon bar times the noise. And so now you can start waving your hand and contraction principle, etc. Um, and so what you expect here, you expect that that the tail probabilities of this guy here, we expect the large deviation principle, will be of the form, some energy that depends on, on this level x here, divided by the speed function, which is epsilon bar square here, so you can translate it back to epsilon 4h. So sanity check, h is a half, you have your, your, your familiar epsilon square, but in general you have a modified uh, speed function. But the other thing that you have to observe it. This is not the original problem. You have to treat the original problem. You're not giving me an answer anymore to the question, when is my log price beyond some level k? But you have an answer for a rescaled log price. And actually, if you look at this one, this one zooms in to zero. So it approaches at the money as, as your time or your epsilon runs to zero. Right? Which, financially speaking, is not a bad idea, because this is all the data, this is all the action is. So you're not unhappy with this. Okay. Right. So now let's see what happens, happens to this Bernstein Busca Florent formula here. Uh, again, you can compare this with the Black Scholes one. So again, in Black Scholes, you would just again you can just force this this this, uh, this uh, moving strikes here that we had to put in the fractional setting. You just force it in here because it's Gaussian. You can just handle it by scaling by hand. So you will find in the Black Scholes setting you will find this. Being more factor here. 
So you forced your epsilon 4 h by changing your k. You place k by x times epsilon to some power, and you arrange it that you see the same epsilon here, otherwise you couldn't compare these guys. Right? Now we do the same leading order matching game, and here is your modified Bernstein Kuster Fraun formula. So you, what you can say is that the implied volatility as your strike somehow moves in, so remember this kt here, kt is x times t to the one half minus h, so that's the one you need to put in here, but then this is the correct generalization of this rough BBF formula. And again, this guy here, the, this is, uh, I mean, as you know from large deviations, the rate function here is given at least formally by the, by the contraction principle formula, so here it is. And what's interesting is if you look at this, this control map here, uh, so this is not an OBE anymore like in the fragment density setting. So what you would have to do is you take your you're minimizing H if you want, and then you have to convolve it and see. So it's a, it's a, it's a fractional optimization problem if you want. So uh, again, this is coffee break conversation. If you can say something very general here, what you can do is deal with small X because then you can you know, do some the local arguments, but anything in the, in the direction of, uh, of uh, global redundant geometry, I mean, understanding some of the, the non-degeneracy on large scales and cut locals and this stuff here, I mean, there are infinite dimensional generalizations of what this means, but the, the pedestrian view of this, I think, is quite poorly understood. Anyway, so here's the, the one explicit example I wanted to give you, so the toy example, of course, is fine, but what people want to see is that this signal is somehow this exponential of your fractional power motion, exponential image of your fractional power motion, then you may compensate for to keep the, the, the mean constant or something. Uh, I don't want to say much more about this. So, let me just say quickly, so it's a, usually a good idea to focus on these digitals that you know we're close to, to uh, our large deviation home base. But if you want to do this call prices one day, then you have to realize they're not very different. So if you do large deviations, you know, when do you get money here? You get money when you're beyond K, yeah? You may get much more money if you go further out, but it's so unlikely that the only contribution comes actually from going right at the strike. And the same is true here. And this is one of one intuition of large deviations. So not surprisingly, these leading order factors are all the same, and it's not hard to prove this basically by, by some soft argument. You just need to have a little bit of control on the moments here, otherwise, then this may be infinity, right? Whereas here, nothing can happen. So, there's a little moment control there. That's, uh, right. oh. So, here's the promised formula. Here are the call prices. Here is the, the slash deviation factor run at this you know, speed function epsilon 4h. Now, in the very beginning, you may or may not remember, we had a t to the 3 half. In terms of epsilon, that's epsilon q. Mm -hmm. And that becomes epsilon to the 1 plus 4 h. And if you plug in h equals 1 half, that works out to be epsilon q. So it's consistent. I mean, this one, you know, you would not have guessed. This one is back of the envelope, okay, but, but this one is maybe not so easy to guess. And then certainly this form here, you would not have guessed. So this is the that's a very general factor, and knowing this factor is exactly what gives you this next order term in this implied volatility expansion. So I'll show you the numerical impact in the book. Okay, you can say a little bit more here, but I don't think you need this. Okay, if you don't like calls, you can also do puts, but then you can you don't need this uh, this uh, additional um, integrability assumptions, and so. I'm being a bit loose here, I haven't given you all the, you know, when does this hold? I mean, it does hold in the one toy example I gave you. And there you need to assume that x is x here. So remember, x is basically what tells you what this k epsilon is. k epsilon is x times epsilon to some power. This x needs to be small. This is like, you know, in Riemannian geometry, that you say there's no cut locus close to the diagonal. Right? But if you want to say something global, then you have to be much, I mean, you can write down the condition, but how do you check, right? So this is, uh, you can check this with x small. And I don't think it's true, you know, so, I mean, it can't be true, right? even in the Riemannian set, it can't be true. Otherwise, so. Right. So, uh, you're not expected to read this, but 
I just want to uh, <laughs> I just want to, to uh, give you evidence that this next order term somehow it's there and there's an expression for it. Okay, so and it doesn't run like t as you have in the model, but t to two h. And well, so, so anyway, this guy can be written down. And, so you can do the, the black show sanity check, but I think you already did this, and you, uh, it must work if it's correct, so it does work. Uh, and the whole thing applies to this prototypical example where we just take a fracture bar motion and stick it into this function signal, which could be the exponential. All right, I skipped. Uh, so let's understand a little bit how you prove such a thing. Um, well, the. So for the large deviation pit, we had to do this, this little rescaling here. So we put everything on the same scale, and so epsilon bar, some of the new speed, or epsilon bar square. And so that's a function of you know rescaled noise. So we like this because for rescaled noise, there's a, you know, there's some Schiller theory, certainly Gaussian setting. And then here is some sort of Ito map, and you know with some good luck, it's continuous. Uh, it can help your luck by <coughs> learning rough paths or lattice structures. So if it were continuous, then you could just use Schiller's theorem and conclude, but in practice, as you know, this is not continuous. There is, uh, well, well, it's just not continuous in general, but there's one fun special case where it is. So if you take the extreme case that, you're, that your two guys are fully correlated, so this low bar would be zero if you can kill this, right? So that means the that the rho is minus one. That's actually not a stupid assumption in finance. Uh, having some extreme correlation, the data models build explicitly. So then this guy will disappear. And what you have here is integral sigma w h d w. There's only one scalar prime motion around. Huh? And if your h happens to be one half, so we're back with Friday and Benson, then you can just rework Peter's formula and realize this is a continuous function of your noise. And you're done. In general, if you have two, then that's not true. And certainly if your h is less than a half, then it's also not true. So it's convenient in that case either to use rough bars if you're in this diffusive setting, and if you're in the, in the fractional setting, h less than a half, then you can build somehow a very simple regulator structure. You could probably do it in other ways, but regulator structures gives you everything you need to do it very nice and elegantly. So I'll show you a little bit of this uh, to solve the problem. So the point here is really that this this map here, it may not be continuous you know, in the usual topologies, but if you switch here the, your viewpoint and you, you enhance your noise, then of course the whole machinery, all these ideas of, of, of uh, Terry and Martin, etc. work. So here's a little bit more. Uh, I mean, where's the rough parts here? If you just have one scalar brown motion, there's no living area, it doesn't make sense. But if you just look at this, Interval and so you know, you're guided by somehow a stochastic Taylor expansion, and you see which are the building blocks that you would need to, to you know, keep under control. Then it's not so hard. I mean, for, forget this W bar. This is some of the other guy, right? Let's focus on this setting of just the scalar brown motion W, and so certainly you will pick up this guy here, W H D W, that corresponds to the case sigma x equals x. If sigma x equals x squared, you have this guy, etc., etc., and you can do the power counting and figure out how many terms you need to keep. Right? And now you can start building, you know, painting your symbols in blue and putting, etc. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So you need. Uh, you need the large deviation principle in this enhanced space, but fortunately, you know, after years of Gaussian rough paths and Gaussian models, there are very general arguments available. I think the, 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 there's been a nice paper by Martin and Handley, but there are also previous in the Gaussian rough paths literature. You can, I mean, there's, there's no secret here. Right? And then the large deviations for your the guy of interest, for this guy here, at least, this guy here, that's easy. That's a consequence. Done. So large deviations are settled, but of course we're not stopping at large deviations. Today we want to go beyond, but even so the, the rate function here it is. There's a little bit of abuse here. This fat pi is somehow the, the extended Ito map, and this H here, so there's a canonical image of the Kamara-Martin element in the model space or in the rough path space. Okay? 
and so that's that's what I'm, I mean here. And to go further, what you need crucially is that you have a unique non-degenerate minimizer. And you have to be careful to formulate what this means. It's easy to write it down. I will keep it at that level, but especially the non-degeneracy, that's a tricky thing to, to I mean, you've, it's well understood, but you have to be careful. Okay, uniqueness, of course, that's not so hard to understand. If you have finitely many minimizers, it's not going to happen here, but then, of course, you can still say something in this Laplace method. If you have a continuum, then then many things can happen, so I, I advise you not to start with this case. But generally speaking, was, so let's put ourselves in the situation as a unique minimizer, depends of course on your target x here, x is fixed. And then trick one is that you, you, know, you readjust your measure to make the arrival here typical. So you put a like, sum of point one here, and then to minimize it, it tells you exactly what to do. So, Okay, I think that comes to the next slide here, so here's the Gaussian factor here. But the other thing you need is, so we'll center everything around x, h, x. So we can make this happen by, by Gaussian. And then, so it's like the opposite of Mollian couples. Mollian couples, you, you keep your, your noise somehow, you don't touch it, but then you move in absolute h directions. And here's the opposite, you keep your h fixed, you know, this is where everything will be again. And then you, so if you look at stochastic perturbations around it, so you do a stochastic Hiller expansion of this guy here. And of course, so let's just, there are many white lights here, right? I'm on model space here, I can't just naively add. So the proper thing to do here is to have a dilation of your model and then do a translation of the model. So there's a little bit of bookkeeping or to, 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 to write this precisely, but of course, if epsilon is gone, and then you're just looking at the control map governed by this minimizer. And then the next, and I think, directional derivatives in epsilon, the first there's an, there's an expansion epsilon, epsilon bar here, epsilon bar, epsilon bar square, there's a remainder. This guy will be first order in W, this will be second order in W. Again, you need to be, I mean, this, is, this may be a rough pass, right? So, what does that mean? I mean, in particular, this means first chaos, this here second, at least inhomogeneous chaos, <coughs> etc. And this part here is crucial if you do the analysis to keep this remainder under control. This is where rough pass helps you a great deal. And if you compare it with the classical Laplace method, the Wiener space, asymptote, Penarus, etc., you have to work hard to keep this remainder under control because it was random, it could be big, you know how to do it, and you have to stop, etc. This rough pass is very easy. You just localized in very strong topology that makes the contribute I mean the whole contribution comes from a much smaller set. And with that smaller set, this guy here you can put very hard to missing estimates. So it's a great deal of simplification. So anyway, I was running ahead here, so you recenter and then you pay a price in terms of this Gisana factor. Right? So if you stare at this guy here, here's the Gisana factor. Here's the epsilon bar, there's a square here. So where does the epsilon come from? Right? If you if you think of perturbing your W, then the perturbation for W is 1 over epsilon h. Right? So that's what you see here. And this guy here, that's the large deviation factor. This is the red painted term that you always had. The next guy is the stochastic interval. So you have to worry about the stochastic interval. Right, because this could be, I mean, there's a one rep silent, this guy could be all over the place. So now, this first order optimality of your minimizer comes to help. It's actually a non trivial little computation that, that uh, so you do first do it on, if you want, you perturb it in Kama Martin directions and then use the continuous extension theory to have this one. So it's the first order optimality that allows you to identify this e tangible here as. Something that has to do with the derivative of the rate function. And so in that context, the non-degeneracy is actually good enough to tell you the rate function is going to be <coughs> smooth, so this is C1. And then times this guy here. And that one, remember here, I told you this is the first chaos. And so this one gives you some explicit relation between that guy, the stochastic Taylor expansion, and this guy here. So this is not true for any H, of course. This is true for because of the, the first optimality. Right? That's good news because now we can get rid of this term here, or at least you know, start doing something, some computations. General stuff, only at the other neighborhood of this minimizer matters. So at the end of the day, where are we? We want to do, I'm sorry, I'm going to do 
right? This is what we, this is a big integral, and the space over which I integrate is this model space, right? And from that model space, I do a localization. This H x when I look at the canonical lift sits in the model space. Then I take a delta neighborhood in that space. Right? And what I'm saying here is that only that neighborhood contributes. Everything away I can throw away. Why is that? Well, that's fluctuations. So, I mean, this is a classical argument. It's actually very similar to what you see in Ben You can throw it away. If you do call options, then you have you need, in addition, this moment control of, you know, to reduce it to, to, to uh, so that you don't suffer from this hacker stick, but that's not a big deal. So, good news. In a Delta neighborhood, we can start doing a lot of things. Namely, now we go back to this expansion here, and we have a great control on this remainder. <coughs> so this is what I said earlier. Here, so. uh, we have not, I mean, the philosophy we did not invent here. This philosophy goes back to a JFA paper by Aida, where he has done it in, uh, in the context of the Brown and Rough Pass. So, so he somehow reproved Ben in the paper, if you want. And they had some applications to, uh, I mean, there was a whole industry later with Inahama Kawabi, so Aida just wrote one paper, but then there was a long uh, list of, of works. So let's zoom a little bit into this, into this remainder estimate. What, what, what's my time here? I know people want to relax at some point. Oh, you are giving me a little bit. Fifteen? Fifteen? Fifteen. Fifteen. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so let's look at a super easy example uh, that, that has even a name. It's called the fractional Stein Stein model. And it's really the famous Elias Stein with his son. So he wrote finance papers at some point. Um, and it's basically the, the model that your volatility is just uh, basically a, a Gaussian process. And now we make it fractional, so, so this would be a very simple version of it. And so now we can start you know, writing down everything. So this x1 bar would just be, you know, this is the case that your sigma functions, remember, the sigma was, okay, there's a little notation overload, this the general ball process, it's a function sigma evaluated at, at the fraction bar motion. And now I take this function to be a fine linear. Right, so you can plug it in, and this is what you get. There's only this guy here. There are no higher order parts in the Cassie Taylor expansion. So again, let's ignore this one. You can take your rule bar equals zero if you want. And so you can write down this ether map somehow explicitly in terms of your building blocks. So there's no sewing, no reconstruction needed. It's an example where you know you have the blocks in front of your eyes. And uh, well, so this is a nice example you can do. Explicitly, uh, in general, so you have something, I think we called it sigma earlier, I'm sorry. You have such an integral here, and you have to do, well, if you want to have your robust view, you have to patch it together using sewing or something like this. Uh, but there's one special case that, that I already pointed out. When your h is one half, then you can rework this with the formula and make it robust. And I want to do this for one simple reason. I want to show you why this remainder estimate, you know, how this works. And I can see it in this example without doing too much. So let's do a fun example here. I want this, this f here, again, it should, it should be a sigma. I take it cubic, right? so why not? And I take h equals one half. So now I can use the tricks that I can't do in general, but the moral still, you know, I can do the same ultimately with rough fast tricks, just here I see it explicitly. So if I take f here cubic, what happens? So I can rewrite this by this formula that will get a quartic term, which is this guy here, if I did my computation correctly. And then I have the quadratic ratio term in this formula that gives me quadratic term, so here. Right? And what I want to see is that what do we know? Our, remember our localization. We said that, that what we know is that, um, so that we work in a, in a neighborhood of the minimizer. And after the sum of shift, the minimizer, I mean, that's zero. We shifted it away. Yeah. So I got rid of this plus h by the sum of shift. And so now we're basically working on a, on a, on a set here, suitably defined the model space that your epsilon times w is smaller than some fixed delta. So I know this. 
What's happening outside, I don't care. Large aggregation allowed me to throw it away a priori. So I can use this information here. Now if I look at my, my little computation here, I can rewrite this guy here, and I see this here. So this is, what can I do when I know that epsilon times, so let's forget the bar, when epsilon w is small, then I can do say something about this epsilon w to the power 4, namely, I can kill, I can make the 4 here, I can make it a 2, because if I split it up, this one, you know, and well, here I don't need it actually, and I wanted to get, I don't want to keep this Gaussian to the power 4, because this is in the exponent, so at some point I need to be able to take expected values, right, for Gaussian, exponential of something quadratic I can handle, if the constant is okay, but certainly nothing quartic. And so this localization helps you. And that's the key. So there's a general theorem. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, so you're not expected to read this. I'll come back to this point uh, in a minute here. So there's a general theorem that tells you that, you know, in, in the generality of this discussion here, you can always have a second order expansion. So where is it here, right? And I can always arrange this remainder is bounded by the norm here, or some homogeneous norm, squared, provided I impose that epsilon w is less than delta. I'm not true without this localization, but true with. And so we see this explicitly here, but that's true in general. It's going to be an exercise in a new edition of the book with Martin in a, in a simpler setting uh, for, for Ravi. So, let's continue it. So the non-degeneracy assumption, again, I didn't write down exactly what this means, uh, implies that your, your rate function here is actually has some regularity. So I, you see this in the formula, that the, the lambda prime actually appeared, that's also classical, and we can write down this additional constant. So if anything, this here is called A, let's go back here, up, 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 up. This was the big formula somewhere. Here. This was the A here, and that's the one thing that I want to show you because it may ring a bell to some of you. I have an expression of this A as an expected value of an exponential of something in the second chaos. There's of course a general you know, theory of such things, and you can spell it out and if you want in terms of infinite dimensional determinants and all sorts of stuff, but uh, I, we didn't find this useful actually. So we have these expressions here. This is stuff that's in the second chaos. So you can, actually, you can really compute these things. Not abstract nonsense, you can compute. Okay, so there's a technical note that at some point, you know, forcing this arrival at, at x here means you're not free to move in your space of, of common Martin drivers. You're constrained in nonlinear fashion to arrive at x. So that translates to that you actually have here um, the appearance of not of, of w but of another Gaussian process v. That is somehow carefully constructed, so that's a this is somehow found in the works of Asenkot already in, in a, let's, let's say a more pedestrian and much more tedious setting. And if you do it properly, so this ends up being a Gaussian process, but it's not adapted. So Asenkot had a whole chapter on anticipating calculus for this, but of course, if you come from a rough bus perspective, this is somehow all uh, you're not afraid of this at all, so this is truly hand fast. Okay, uh, blah 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 blah. Okay, I think I don't need to say much more about this. So you really get this expression here. This is what I promised, t to the 2h, something that depends on x, you can be more explicit. And let me just tell you that this whole thing works. This is not just an exercise. If you do a Monte Carlo simulation, that is, uh, and this is stress test. We have put the very vicious parameters. The, the solid line is the real, the, the perfect solution with brute force Monte Carlo. The green line down here is somehow first order BBF approximation, and the improvement with this, you know, fine asymptotics is this, this line here. So it's not perfect, but again, it took very vicious parameters here. So that was actually a great picture for us. And if you work with reasonable parameters, then I mean, it's bang on. If you zoom in, you see that uh, even the improvement. I mean, you see the improvement here, and then you see that it works here if you want. Okay. So a uh, quick conclusion here. So rough wall models are a little bit intractable. The combination of large deviations, Laplace method, rough paths, relative structures, that's 
it really works and you can start and, and conclude till the end if you want. Um, if, you're, if you're generous about the remainders and you're willing to do back of the envelope computations, then this, this whole technology is actually a way of making this rigorous. Right? You don't care about the, the, the remainder, you can do this computation or this, you can do these computations quickly, you write the formula, but why is it true? And the ultimate justification is somehow using this, this uh, rough technology. Right, this is something if you're interested in local volatility, this is coffee time conversation. <laughs> and here's the promised toy structure. I'm not going into just that you have seen it. So if you think of related structures <laughs> and you compare it with geometric rough paths. <coughs> So inside the, the world of branch rough paths, the geometric rough paths are somehow the boring linear trees. Right? And somehow this, this, this story here complements it, it does the other extreme. Instead of going up very, very you know, long stick, you make a very bushy tree. So if you have h equals you know, 1 point... So h equals 1 over 8 is that the cutoff that you are you have with the structure. If h goes to zero, you can make it as pushy as you want, you have infinitely many symbols, and then, okay, so, so it's a nice example, it complements this. And, but at the same time, you don't want to put it in a rough pass or branch rough pass framework, because there's no claim that you know all the cross intervals, and I don't care, right? I don't want to define w, d, w, h. It's rubbish, I don't care. But this one, I just keep the ones I want. And so, in the end, the data structures has exactly this, this lean way of, building what you need, so uh, there's no point reinventing branch graph paths in the setting here because it's, it's all there. Okay? So you can play around with co-products and co-actions and T plus, T minus, it's, it's all there. It's a very nice example. So I promised uh, Giuseppe that there would be a little bit on single SPDs. My excuse is that Tom is here next week and you're still there. Um, so this is what you can do with Massimiliano's uh, software. Hey, is he here? No. Yeah, I don't keep advertising, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure it helps the cost. Yeah. It's almost like PowerPoint. You can take a snapshot and, and drop it into your file. I love it. So, uh, okay. GPAM, if you haven't seen it before, then this is not the moment you'll learn it, but if you have, you know exactly, <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. So this is the, the heat operator at the right hand side is, is a function of the solution times white noise. And if you do this in, in spatial white noise, if you do it in two dimensions, then this is I think the, the most elementary example of a of a non-trivial single SPD. Okay? And so I spare you this power counting. I mean, you've seen this many times, including today with, with Hendrik. Um, so you have to uh, to renormalize, you get these extra terms that come out. And all this is somehow part of another paper, not of the one with Tom. This is the, uh, still the, the Maryland paper with Giuseppe and Paul Garcia, where we had to think about, you remember what I said earlier, that it's somehow similar to Maryland calculus, but the roles of H and W are exchanged. But if you want to do the Rubletta structure approach, I mean, half of the work in Rubletta structure, correct me if I disagree, is somehow setting up the stage. And maybe not half, but. The, but there's, you need to write a lot of pages to, to make sure all the symbols are the way thing. So if you understand that there are no deep arguments happening yet, it's just setting up the stage here. It's similar as, similar as here. You have to set up the stage here. So if you want to solve this in this world of regular structure, so this is the, the classical one. You have the symbol for the noise. Then you have your symbol for for the um, second second chaos guy. You know kernel convolution noise times. Noise, so this is what you need to renormalize in the, in the zero chaos, but then it converges in the second chaos, etc. Then you have these guys which are harmless, and that way, this is how you build a model. And if you have this H guy around, that H a priori, a camera mountain path, doesn't look much nicer than the noise if you work on the Hilda scale. And so, so I say this again if you have a camera mountain path, which is perfectly nice in the sense of, you know, Bounds variation and it is W12, but it embeds on the Hurdle scale just in C1 half. So the Hurdle scale, it looks almost as bad as Brown motion. And particularly, it couldn't, in the Hurdle sense, do the pairing of H and W. So if I want an integral HGW and I just know young Hurdle version, I can't do it. 
So once you step outside the health scale, of course you can. And so on the formal level, you have to treat it just as a. Oh, this is getting really bad. I apologize. <laughs> so this was the, this, this picture. You know, we lift the noise as we solve it as a model distribution. We project it down, and this is getting even worse. But at least you can see that. Uh, I'm very sorry for this. So the one thing you have to take away is you need a different, an additional symbol for H. Yeah? Because on, if you work in this Helda, you know, framework, then you need it as a symbol here because it looks no better a priori, but when you construct the model, of course, you can use all the tricks you know, and at this moment, so you, I mean, on the level of of symbols, you need all these, these cross guys here. Oh, this is a disaster. Mm. And so at some point, you need to construct the, the, if you want, the canonical model associated to this guy. So for the noise itself, you have to do something. You have to renormalize and converge, etc. But the punchline here is that adding this common mountain perturbation, actually, it doesn't interfere with renormalization. You can just, I mean, you have to work, but you can construct this model somehow by hand, and it likes. It's, it isn't a good builder space. Uh, what I should say is that uh, there have been some general arguments by Philip uh, in his Malibu paper where this was much simplified, that this would also affect this one. But uh, the reason we focused on, on GPAM to redo this, this Laplace stuff is that here all, the, you know, all this landscaping was already in place. So we, we knew the world in which we were walking around, and otherwise we have to go back into a more general setting, which Okay. So at the end of the day, we have a perfectly good translation operator on the space of models. So everything is continuous, and you do need this when you do this, you know, this shifting, the Gibbs-Janov transform. You you want to have this. So now I have probably zero minutes left, but I have three slides. I hope I'm okay. So let's go back to what we wanted to do. And there's there's a let's say a latest theory that at least I want to show you. From what you have seen, I hope you will believe that this can be done. So, if you have a, a family of random variables with a large deviation principle, it's epsilon, then this contraction principle tells you that it's stable on the push forward of a continuous function, right? And then there's something called the Valadan lemma. So, again, I suspect many of you have seen this. This is one to three large deviation theory, and it tells you whenever you have a large deviation principle, you also have a Laplace principle on this logarithmic, you know, double twiddle scale, and what you, I mean, you pick out basically the infimum of your function f here, plus the rate function j here for the for the y's. So you can forget at this level, you can forget about the the, the x's. This is just a statement of what does it mean for y epsilon to have an distribution principle. You apply the other uh, lemma, and this is what you get. But here in the setting here, because your, your large deviation principle for y comes from the previous one, you have a pre-image x, you can rephrase it in this way here. And that's actually better for us because it's a question where you want to integrate. Do you want to integrate here on this you know, space y, or do you want to integrate on the pre-space x? Or you, you choose. Right? It's better to work on the in our setting on the previous one, so that's the that's the formula when you pull it back to x, because this here, so the x here for us, this guy here, that's the noise space or the model space, right? Whereas y would be the solution, or let's say the reconstructed solution, so this in some well, uh, space in space time, or maybe distribution, and then chip as a function, and then f is just some observable. So wherever you are here, whatever space you land in, you map, you have a continuous bound map to the reals. So f is not the problem here. The problem is this phi here, but that too is somehow not really the problem because we made it continuous. So it helps a big deal. And then you have this initial lifting map, but that one you know, was dealt with. We had the noise, we lift it, there's large deviations, so at that moment we can forget about it, and we have everything in place. So what you have to do is repeat this program here. So Again, you have the large deviation on the level of the enhanced noise, so this would be our x epsilon. The solution map is this map phi that's continuous. Then we do the Laplace method on this model space. Right? We have the large deviation principle there, so we can carry out this this, uh, this localization around some minimizer assumed to be unique and non-degenerate. And then, of course, you need 
F, you know, like in the other lemma, continuous bound, it is okay, you can make generalize if you want, and you need it, the shape C3 near the image of the minimizer because you want to do some local expansion, so F shouldn't interfere, right? The tricky part is in any case, it's the phi. That's where you use your stochastic rough Taylor type expansions with the remainder estimator that I've shown you, that I've explained a little bit why it works the way it works, and then the, the meta theorem here is of this form here. So this is the, the Varada lemma factor, and then in this setting here, it's actually, in a sense, it's a little bit easier here because you don't have this, this uh, you know, singular target condition. You're not trying to get to some point x here. So the minimization here takes place over all, uh, over the whole space h, right? There's no subclass of admissible controls that's turning to x here. So. Uh, as a result, uh, I mean, it's a different problem if you want, but uh, the underlying ideas are similar. And so, at the end of the day, you don't get any epsilon factor here, it's just a constant here that you can also express as the exponential, the expected values of exponential or something in second chaos if you want. And uh, that's, a, that's a meta theorem. But I've shown you exactly all the steps that we need to implement. And uh, for GPAM, certainly we have all these things, and it, it's not specific at all to GPAM. I mean, we can make a list of one to three what you need to check. It's just uh, okay. I should so uh, scale blah blah blah. Aida, I mentioned there was a series of papers. So blah blah blah. blah. I mentioned the paper with uh, Giuseppe and Paul and Marvin Kalkulus, and um, this was the first paper on LDPs for single SPDs. Uh, this is the this finance paper that I was talking about in the beginning. This joint work with uh, Paul Garcia Pigato. And there was a big paper on Raffol as a regulated structure with Christian Bayer and uh, Jörg Martin, uh, Benjamin Stemper, uh, and also Paul Garcia. So thank you very much. <laughs>